Okay, here's another uh, little mystery that we can ponder. So, in the beginning, we had high enough energy that you could actually create, out of the photons, the pure energy of the early universe that was floating around, the photons, way, way more powerful than your typical gamma rays. Powerful enough that out of that you could create particle-antiparticle pairs. So according to quantum mechanics, as long as uh, you obey energy conservation, matter can turn into pure energy by combining matter and antimatter. Anybody who's watched Star Trek knows that. Okay? But the process can also be run backwards, and so you can have pure energy turn into particle-antiparticle pairs. So you can have photons that are powerful enough turn spontaneously all by themselves without any encouragement from outside turn into an electron anti-electron pair now how long will that last well electrons and anti-electrons are oppositely charged and therefore they will attract each other and when they attract each other and merge then they're going to produce pure energy in other words another photon so it's really a soup of particle anti-particle pairs that are that are being created and then destroyed by their own recombination over and over and over. That's the earliest universe. And you've got electron-anti-electron -electron pairs and then at an earlier time it's hot enough that you can actually produce pho that you'll have photons that are powerful enough they can actually produce proton and anti-proton pairs. And those are you know 2,000 times more powerful roughly. 1,860 times uh, more massive, and so it takes 1,860 times more energy to produce those. And if you go back further, you can produce even heavier particles and antiparticles. Now, as the universe, let's go forwards in time now again, and the universe goes forwards in time, and then the matter and the antimatter, of course, they, they run into each other and annihilate, and then they want to perhaps have those photons split again, but you know what? If the universe is expanding, it is cooling. It is stretching out those photons. Those photons are becoming less energetic. More of the energy of the universe is going into its expansion, and less of it remains in the form of its photons wandering around. And a point comes where those photons are low enough energy that they can't produce protons and antiproton pairs. Then, whatever proton-antiproton pairs are out there, sooner or later they're going to find each other, sooner, actually, rather than later, because they're oppositely charged, and, and boom, they're going to turn into a photon, and then that photon's not going to be able to go back into being a proton-antiproton pair. And eventually that's true also of the electron-antielectron pairs, and that's about the lightest particle there is, except for the neutrino. And so you ought to expect that, well, at least the simplest universe you would imagine would be one where there's exact perfect balance between matter and antimatter in this early universe. And therefore, as the universe cools, you should end up with no matter and no antimatter. It should all just be photons. All photons. Just photons. Spreading out. Following the Hubble expansion. Well, of course, that's not what we got. That's not what we see. So, there's got to be a slight imbalance in these processes, a symmetry that is not perfectly obeyed, but pretty close. Because we do have matter left over, and we don't have any antimatter left over. Whatever antimatter is produced is produced locally recently and doesn't last very long before it finds an antiparticle partner to run into and smash into and then disappear. So antimatter is an extremely, unbelievably, extremely tiny fraction of the matter in the universe today. So we have an imbalance. It's not very much. Only one part per billion. So, that's another way of describing how many photons there are of the cosmic background radiation compared to the number of particles of matter. There's about a billion photons out there, and most of the photons out there are cosmic background photons. There's about a billion of them for every individual particle of matter. Every electron, every proton, every, um, you know, I'm trying to think of stable particles, uh, that's out there, okay? So, 
that's pretty good but not perfect. Why is there an imbalance? Well, at least we know that there are other symmetry, there are other broken symmetries in the laws of physics and so it doesn't amaze us that there might be an imbalance here. Clearly, physics is not totally done. Even the standard model is perfectly as it's obeyed. Um, we don't have an answer for this imbalance. There's, there's still new physics to be learned. I'll leave that as a mystery because I can't tell you the answer. We don't know the answer. Um, well, let's summarize. Okay, so we're, we're this is the last slide of any content. Inflation not only has solid observational support, it's very difficult to see how any mechanism generating inflation doesn't just have to be the the splitting of the four forces of nature, but we can't think of any mechanism that could generate inflation that would not also produce a near infinite number of universes. So we're going to talk about that in more detail with the next and the final chapter that we're going to go over this coming week. And that, strangely enough, is the chapter on life. So the early parts of that, we're going to talk about why it turns out that eternal inflation also provides a natural explanation for why we have a living universe. In fact, if there really is one and only one universe in the whole of all existence, <coughs> it's very, very hard to see why this one would be so lucky in the chosen 20 free parameters that describe the standard model of particle physics. Why those 20 free parameters would just happen to work out to support the ability for complexity to develop. It's way easier to go wrong. There's very few universes that if you just cook up those 20 free parameters randomly, you're going to get anything except maybe black holes that emerge instantly, and it, black holes are very, very simple things, or just particles flying apart that never collapse. You need stuff collapsing on big scales to support environments that are stable enough to per permit the evolution of complexity and there's a lot of ways to go wrong and, and anyway we'll, we'll talk about that more in the next lecture I won't do it all now for you but but in, eternal inflation solves a problem that otherwise doesn't seem to have a solution um, a solution which is um, other than religious okay so there are so you can't just say well God did it yeah not very satisfying, okay, to, to, to come up with a, a supernatural being who just, you know, has every Swiss army knife you could imagine, and yet who isn't also complex. It, it actually defies, you know, um, a reasonable look, but I'm not going to go into that either. <laughs> um, that, would, that would take me too far afield. All right. So we're almost at the end. Here's our red slide. There's our summary for cosmology. Of course, there's way more that can be said on cosmology. If you want to learn more, um, I'd highly recommend the, uh, the, the YouTube videos from uh, Lawrence Krauss. He's done some really great stuff there. And Sean Carroll has also got some great stuff. Um, and it's, it's good to see. And it's on level on levels that, um, you know, Cabrillo undergraduate students uh, could understand. And, you know, it's always good to be challenged a little bit. You want to be stretched. Stretched is growth. Growth in knowledge is a good thing. Um, yeah, and once you start doing that, of course, YouTube's going to come up with all kinds of other uh, YouTubes that are on the right side of your, your screen and that you can click on also. And so there's just so much great stuff out there. But this is enough for us right now. And let's see if there's any more that I want to tell you. I think there might be. Because um, you're going to be quizzed on this someday. Comes our final exam. We'll have quiz six, which will cover cosmology as well. Um, so summarizing some of our cosmology, we learned there's dark energy, and the evidence for dark energy 
is that white dwarf supernovae are dimmer than expected in distant galaxies. And that means they have expanded away, farther away than we would have thought given the recession velocities that we measure. So that's telling us that the universe is actually accelerating its expansion. Okay, White dwarf supernovae, type 1a supernovae, are dimmer than we would expect. Okay. Um, so during the first few minutes after the Big Bang, there was hope early, early on, I mean like 60, 70, 80 years ago, that maybe nuclear fusion reactions would have made everything, all the 92 chemical elements, but we actually did the detailed calculations and realized that no, we couldn't, because we couldn't get around the lithium beryllium roadblock. By the time there was enough helium around that you could try and maybe make some carbon out of it, the way stars do, the density was already too low to get them together. Remember, to make carbon you need three heliums to all run into each other at the same instant in order to make carbon. And uh, so the universe itself could not do that. Stars can do that because they're very dense and they're very hot and they stay that way for a long, long time. The universe did not stay that way for a long, long time. It expanded too quickly and so that didn't work. So yeah, you need to remember that. By the time there was enough helium around, the density was too low. Okay, now another question you might ponder is when we look out 14 billion light years, are we seeing the entire universe? And I hope you realize now the answer is no. We're only seeing the observable universe. We're only seeing what has had a chance for light to get to us. And light has not had a chance to get to us from farther away than that because it's moving away from us now faster than the speed of light. So no matter how fast it tries to travel, of course, it's only going to be able to go at the speed of light. So, no, it does not encompass the entire universe. The entire universe that obeys our laws of physics. I'm not talking about the multiverse. I'm talking about just our individual instantation of the multiverse, our individual universe. Even that is probably infinite or almost infinite. It's certainly bigger than it's bigger than we can see by a factor of, you know, 10 to the 90th or some huge number, which keeps changing as we get better data. Uh, when did radiation first travel freely for long distances <coughs> without interaction with matter? Well, that was when the protons and the electrons were first able to combine because they were moving slowly enough now. The temperature was cooler than 3,000 degrees. So when the protons and electrons first combined to form atoms, atoms of hydrogen, that's when the microwave background photons were then free to travel. Because remember, hydrogen is most of the universe. And of course, the same is true of helium. They would be free to combine by then as well. So neutral atoms can only absorb photons if they have the magic wavelengths. And if they're charged particles, though, they interact with any photon. And so the universe is opaque. Um, okay. So now let's do a little imagination. Suppose you instantly, magically take yourself out to the very stuff that is the cosmic microwave background. Okay? So you identify a little patch and say, that's a lump. I think that lump's going to turn into a galaxy with stars and planets and people on the planets, and I'm going to just instantly transform myself and be one of those people. Okay? Now, you're there. And now you're looking back towards us. What will you see? Will you see a Milky Way galaxy with spiral arms and all that? No. The light of the present Milky Way with all that structure hasn't had a chance to get to you yet. You're going to see our Milky Way galaxy as it was 13.7 billion years ago. And back then it was just 3,000 degree hot gas too. You're just going to see cosmic background radiation. So everybody in the universe sees the same thing. It's just made of different stuff. Different. The names you would attach to individual particles are different. But the, but the laws of physics are the same. And so everybody, everywhere, sees the same thing. Within this entire universe, vastly bigger than the observable universe that we can actually see. Okay. So we, in the Milky Way 
to you now at that edge, you would just see us as microwave background. Worth remembering. Okay, so now, summarize what is the favored cosmological model. The favored cosmological model is a universe that is at critical density. So I hope you got that. If you got nothing else out of that chapter, I hope you got that. And the mass energy density is dominated not by matter, not even by dark matter, but by dark energy. Something even a little more mysterious. So our universe is dominated by dark energy already. Again, it's about 68% of all the matter energy that there is. Um, and then if we go back to the beginning of the chapter, remember we talked about Olber's Paradox. So Olber's Paradox was if you just start with the simplest of all universes, one which is just infinitely peppered with stars, and they've lasted forever because if you, you know, if you want a simple universe, why have a beginning? That's uh, not as simple as the universe that's infinite in time. Infinite in time, infinite in space. Okay? Then, the prediction is you should see a night sky that's as bright as the surface of a star. Since we don't see that, that means the universe of imagined by Newton and Olbers could not exist. There had to be a beginning or there had to be an edge to space. Now, it's true you can refine that prediction by putting in the expansion, which redshifts the light over a finite realm. Um... But, in fact, we do know now that the universe does look like it had a beginning. Um, and what is the curvature of our universe? So, to say that we have a critical density universe is also to say that the curvature of the universe is zero. We live in a overall flat universe. It's kind of like a table that's been sanded, but not sanded very well, and so it's got lumps in it. You know, if you run your hand over it, there's lumps, there's hills, and there's little valleys, and not very much, but they're there. Light would follow paths like that, but if you make that table infinitely big, it would still be a, quote, flat table. So yes, light doesn't really travel in straight lines. It does follow little curvy paths as it goes through regions of higher and lower density, but the overall path of the light is, quote, flat. It's really a two-dimensional term, and you have to extend it to a three-dimensional universe because we have three dimensions of space but it gets across the point okay so they're they're like straight lines but they're not drawn very straight because there is lumpiness in the universe and that affects how gravity uh, makes things curve as we talked about um, there's about a billion cosmic microwave background photons for every particle of matter in the universe. So we talked about that today. You should, <coughs> you should remember that. Okay, it means there was a slight imbalance in the matter-antimatter. A billion particles of matter for every billion and one, or excuse me, a, a billion and one particles of ordinary matter for every billion particles of antimatter in the early moments when there was still a lot of antimatter around out there. And there was plenty of energy for the photons to split into particle-antiparticle pairs. Okay. Um, do the laws of physics as presently understood permit the idea of multiple universes with different forces and different fundamental properties? So we're going to talk about that again more um, this coming week, but uh, and I'm, in fact, I've already, I've already recorded that. It's already on YouTube. You guys can listen to it whenever you want. Um, and the answer to that is yes. It looks like we, it, it actually solves a lot of problems that otherwise don't look like they have easy solutions. And um, yeah, different universes with different laws. We just happen to live in this one, and it's the you rolled the dice, the twenty different dice that. Uh, determined our universe, its laws, and we came out with what we came out with, and uh, actually turned out pretty lucky. We hit the, the lottery, we hit the jackpot, because it permits life. And light, we love life. I mean, we're alive. 
Uh, okay, anything else I need to make sure you understand? Um, we want to go back into history a little bit. Not very far, actually. Why was inflation originally attractive? What was so exciting uh, to Alan Gooch when he first realized that inflation was actually consistent with the laws of physics that we already knew, and yet it had this fantastic property of huge expansion when you add negative energy to empty space? Um, what was attractive about it is it could explain why the universe would have the same temperature on opposite sides of the sky. And in fact, when you take into account the, the rate of expansion over the whole universe, even place you don't even have to go to opposite sides of the sky to have a problem explaining why they're exactly the same temperature. Even places just a degree or two apart from each other on the sky were still out of causal contact, always. So how'd they know to come to the same temperature? And inflation solved that by saying, ah, but you don't realize the first tiny, 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 tiny fraction of a second the universe expanded way more than you thought. And so it came from a way tinier place where the universe actually had plenty enough time. They were close enough for temperatures to equilibrate very well during that tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of a second. And then got blown out and has now been expanding at the more leisurely rate of the Hubble expansion. Okay, so what's um, more that I need to tell you? Um, okay. Uh, Boy, it looks like I've covered everything. Um, well, good. All right, you guys are ready. You guys are ready. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and end this, and uh, I'm going to get this uploaded to YouTube tonight. And uh, enjoy. Part 3 of Cosmology, Astro 4, Cabrillo College. Thank you, guys.